Hi, and thank you for having me. Um, I did something very novel for today, and I prepared. I've never done that before. I've been reading through my notes a little bit more. I spent the day in front of the computer yesterday. But uh, I read a couple of things last week and learned a couple of things and caused me to sort of nuke the presentation that I had put together and start from new yesterday. So that's where I'm at right now. Um, so please excuse me if I read from my notes. I'm going to start off with, and I just actually, uh, part of this is because of Maurice's admiration of Bucky Fuller, but, oh, 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 no, uh -oh. Uh -oh. But here's a picture of my father receiving the first Bucky Fuller Institute uh, Award back in 2008. Um, this segues in with the, a lot of the issues that I want to talk about today and their solutions. And they begin with working with my father and his sort of unique look at biology and science and nature as systems. And the Bucky Award was recognition of that thinking. And here's the Bucky uh, Award at our offices in Woods Hole, and I think it's to remind us to keep our thinking comprehensive, both like Bucky and my father, and iconoclastic as well. My work has been to weave the, uh, the thinking of my father into real life, real scale infrastructure, and we'll show examples of that throughout the presentation. And that is using nature and biodiversity as a matrix, and apply this to uh, and apply this to real world infrastructure scales. JTED's mission has been to design with nature and apply the inherent robustness and human wisdom to human systems. Good applied ecology should sustain both the human component and the environment. <laughs> Uh, this quote begins with uh, the story, uh, begins our story of phosphorus. And this was from the Buck Fuller Award, and it's a profound vision. It was about John's paper, and it says a profound vision to heal the environmental and economic scars of Appalachian region and detailed strategy to build a dynamic, sustainable economic basis for lasting renewal. And the paper was on how to repair the devastated coal lands of Appalachia, where they've been strip mining mountaintops went on to say that this is one of the only true whole system projects that is place-based but widely applicable. And throughout the presentation, I'll try and show you examples of how we have applied this type of thinking. And especially the one element that I'm going to focus on today is phosphorus and how we can manage that either in a very constructive or destructive manner. Um, so we're going to tell you our ecological story and show you examples of some of the solutions that have come up along the way and show you where we have or could have or should have managed and harvested phosphorus. So in the conventional industrial agricultural model, we use carbon-based fuels to convert phosphates to rock to the soluble phosphoric acid found in our fertilizers. This high energy process creates five tons of radioactive phosphogypsum in every one ton of fertilizer we produce. It seems by managing our resources locally, we can do better. And by doing so, we'll hopefully save our planet as well. Applying good ecological design to all facets of our food, water, and energy systems is the one path I see and I hope for our collective futures. Uh, this is the consequence of the present industrial agricultural practice. Because in conventional agriculture, they have to oversaturate the, for the soils because they've been stripped of their natural nutrients. They have to oversaturate it in order to get the crop yields that we've been discussing throughout the day. That every time there's a rain or a storm event, the runoff of the phosphorus and the nitrogen causes fish kills, causes eutroph eut eutrophic lakes, dying rivers, dead barriers and compromised ocean ecologies, coastal ecologies, which again goes into our rivers. What might be uh, called alarming foresight, China's recognizing that phosphorus is a really finite resource. source. And so they have up to 300% uh, tariffs, uh, export tariffs on their rock phosphate.
Phosphorus is an element. There's a finite amount on Earth. This can neither be destroyed nor created. The amount we have on the planet is all we have. The 75% of the global phosphorus being located in Morocco, or phosphate rock being located in Morocco, coupled with the fact that phosphorus is essential to the production of food, it seems obvious that it behooves us to manage it well. Under present management, or lack thereof, we pay a huge premium, both financial and environmental, to this element. When we allow it to wash into our waters as a very high harmful pollutant, to my thinking, managing it locally in conjunction with our local farmers, municipalities, and energy producers, we can create a sustainable model. Only if we shift the paradigm away from our present heavy-handed, large carbon footprint methodology and move forward with a local means of living. Apply ecology, this is where I'm going to get a little worried that I won't do it long. How we apply that the ecology is the dynamics of the natural world. Sorry, I'm not used to doing it this way. The dynamics of the natural world give us an example of how to design systems capable of self-organization, self-repair, and to self-replicate. Ecological design, or eco-memetics, is an applied ecological science and practice that addresses human, human needs. Ecological design is rooted in the precepts, principles, and dynamic systems inherent in ecosystems and evolutionary processes. Ecological design and engineering can be applied to a broad, broad spectrum of activities, including energy uh, and fuel production, the cultivation of food waste, and conversion of landscape restoration and management, forestry and agro-systems, Ecological design can be applied to architecture, community, urban design, and planning. It can be used to create ecological industrial parks, including the manufacturing of new materials and products from natural systems. Ecological design can, be, can assist in the formation of social and economic systems adapted to an emerging era of resource constraints and information richness. In, uh, so whether we partner with nature in Haiti to protect our, the health of our downstream neighbors, here, when I was in Haiti after the earthquake, I found a pipe dead ending of the, the compound we were in, and all of the effluent from our compound and the camp next door went into a stream that went through this wetland backyard. And here it is coming out of the wall, and right on the other side of the wall of the compound where the stream ran out, was where people had to, but this is the only accessible water for the people there to do laundry after the earthquake. Um, it was devastating. Uh, so we did a couple of things there that we'll get into a little later in order to help improve that situation. But it's also a very graphic illustration of how we're managing water and nutrients as a culture here as well. This June in Grafton, we opened the Fisherville Canal Restore Eco Machine. Grafton is an old mill site, and the canal water is highly contaminated by Bunker C or Number Six oil. For those of you unfamiliar, this is like a mix of motor oil and asphalt. It's very nasty. It's very sticky, viscous, and very toxic. We worked with Paul Stamets and the team from Fungi Perfecti, and with cooperation from the MASP, the EP, the US EPA, the National Park Service, the Blackstone Headwaters Coalition, Clark University, and Eugene Barnett, we came together to apply an ecological system on a site-wide scale to remove toxic petroleum hydrocarbons. This EQ machine is uh, unique from her predecessors in the area, unique ecologies engineered to support all five kingdoms of life. Working with Paul Stamets, uh, we intentionally added uh, one additional component to its name. It's that came one of the kingdoms of life that we had managed the least up to now, and that was fungi. <coughs> These black and yellow bins that you see here contain a wood chip media, each inoculated with four different species of fungi. The hydraulic loops of this eco machine are designed to carry the contaminated water through the fungi that secrete enzymes capable of breaking down the hydrocarbons and also carrying those enzymes into the outside environment, which you see in this last slide right here. So, um, into the outside environment. So this system is designed not only to treat in situ in the greenhouse, 
but also to act as an ecological chemostat, sending out all the beneficial compounds and biologies back into the canal. So in this system, we were managing phosphorus as well. We've only uptake into the plants and growing algae. We can, harm some of the, we can harness some of the phosphorus that comes to us from the wastewater plants and stormwater upstream. By using ecomimicry to treat the oil, we then created the opportunity to harvest phosphorus as well. We got the results back from the ground last month. Our data surpassed our greatest hopes. It showed that the eco machine was removing 85% of the effluent going through it, influence going through it, of petroleum, hydrocarbons, in the first month of operations. This was before the system was even fully mature. So the combination of those aquatic ecologies combined with the fungal communities and those yellow boxes was breaking down the petroleum hydrocarbons from up to 6,000 micrograms per liter in the canal to below 500 after the tank number six in the green. So we're encouraged. Um, again, uh, the earlier speakers alluded to this, and quite some time ago, my father and myself and some of his students set out different scale systems to use ecology to transform wastes to value-added products. And using the natural paradigm that there is no waste and the waste of one is food to another, we set out to show that both on a physical scale but also show that it could work on an economic scale. So this was a municipal wastewater treatment plant that treated 20% of the wastewater from South Burlington but in a side train, we also decided or took up the challenge of treating brewery waste, which was mostly spent grain and yeast, mixing it from with chicken straw from an organic chicken hatchery, and we pasteurized it, then inoculated it with oyster mushroom spawn. So this garbage, which was once a liability, was now producing oyster mushrooms. These oyster mushrooms then went for $9.99 a pound at City Market in Burlington. <laughs> but we weren't done with the garbage yet, and we sent it to the worm department. And there the worms did their thing to it, and they broke it down into such a powerful combination. And you think beer and mushrooms, college students have had it down for years, but we did it in college here. Um, and so we put the beer and mushrooms uh, together, and we grew such a potent growing media that we were able to get seven croppings in Vermont between November and March out of these uh, mixed greens without supplemental heat or lighting, which meant it worked on an economic basis as well. So I was speaking naturally from that there. <laughs> All right, so if we manage our nutrients locally, we can have this. And so by using the principle that nature there is no waste, and, our, and, and we apply this to our food, food production systems. This is a sketch of an agriculture system that's based on the eelgrass communities. Our friend Bill Levin is using this now in Haiti, and he's teaching basically where people are living on 600 calories a day and they're just <coughs> excess waste, and no capacity or energy to tend to agriculture system. By using these self-sustaining systems, he is allowing people to nurture themselves, creating secondary economies without creating high-tech, carbon fuel dependent systems. And now he found that these systems are just repli repli replicating themselves throughout the countryside. And he's no longer having to go down there and raise money. But people are actually carrying bags of concrete 12 miles into the bush and as communities building them. The other funny thing about that is it created a new economy for people who are infirm or too old to work in the fields or in other means. And they would gather papaya leaves and banana leaves and manure and grow them in the fish ponds, which caused algae worms, which the tilapia would eat, and they would grow faster, and they would have the food. So all of a sudden, people who had been sort of cast off by society then had an occupation by integrating ecology into the food. Now, the way we manage phosphorus now, we allow it to run off into the fields and in, off the fields and into our waterways 
where you can create algae blooms. And algae blooms, if you're not feeding it to fish, can be devastating. They can completely kill lakes. They can cause fish kills. They cause the dead zone of the side of New Jersey. It kind of brings a lot of jokes to my in the next <laughs> But um, but it can also be an incredible asset. So if after a wastewater treatment plant, pond, we have uh, algae ponds, we can then reclaim that phosphorus that was slipping through our fingers, and we can convert it into energy. We can convert it into fire. We convert it into compost or we can park it in some fish flesh, eat it again, put it back to the wastewater treatment system, which is local, and then convert it back to algae, put it back to fish, eat it again. So we can you see we're getting local and we're getting cyclical. Um, the principles of ecological design can be scaled to work at YMCA in Ontario, not California, Canada. Um, that's where we all have to say. Uh, uh, in Ontario, or, and you know, of course I have mixed feelings about having done this project, but this is a 1.2 million gallon a day high strength waste treatment plant in Tyson, Maryland. Tyson, uh, Berlin, Maryland, operated by Tyson Foods. Um, they had been fined over $5 million over five years for being out of compliance, throwing ammonia into the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Uh, we then retrofitted their activated sludge lagoon with an ecological system for less than a million dollars, which is unheard of in the industry. And by using plants, uh, we were able to keep them compliant. And just so you can put a perspective on that, they were getting fines for having ammonia levels over 12 milligrams per liter. We averaged around one, never went over two during our period of operation. But also by Using the power of ecology, they were able to reduce their energy, which is in the form of used in the form of aeration, by 74 percent. And in the first year of operations, Tyson saved 150 thousand dollars in electricity. Here in Fuzhou, China, where they were using the canals that had been run throughout the city uh, to deal with their growing city and growing populations to move wastewater out of the city and into the harbor. And that was sustainable, unsustainable and unpleasant for all of the reasons that are obvious on the left-hand side of the slide. And we used the same restorer technology that we uh, adapted for Tyson chicken and put it in the waste canals in Fuzhou. And we were able to get in the water in compliance with the UN open water discharge standards. Uh, in that pilot back in 2002, 2003. And here's a case where we had a great client and we did a good system. What the Wailalai development, who was doing this development for Four Seasons in Kona, proposed to do to keep this golf course pond uh, algae free was to use 60 horsepower over here to pull water up from a deep aquifer and then 40 horsepower to put it back down the deep injection well, just pumping water through so fast that they wouldn't, it wouldn't have an opportunity to get an algae bloom. So we had an opportunity to counter-propose using an ecological system, and by using an airlift pump of two and a half horsepower, we were able to pull it through enough to catch growth and biodiverse ecology to keep a very high aesthetic level of water quality. You can tell in the slide, but you can see the bottom there. But not only that, because we had a great client, he decided to see what he, what, what he could do with it. And he, just, he was an agriculturalist, so he threw a fish in it. He put in fin fish, oysters, and Pacific white trim. And it says in this caption, when a chef at the Four Seasons Resort, while a lot, needs a fish or a shrimp for a dish of fresh supplies available at the bowl of the golf course. <laughs> the part of this EPA award that we got and this article that I'm so proud of, it says, if we set another area up as a fish pond without the system, it would cost close to $10,000 a month in power. This one runs on about 400. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Next story in this series of somewhat related stories is the Omega Institute. And in 2003, uh, Skip Backus, who was the director of the Omega Institute, came to us and started talking about their wastewater problem. They didn't really have a system there. They had bleaching fields, and it sort of went via the groundwater into a pond, and you were really seeing an unhealthy pond, and they were starting to get smells, and the clients or guests at the Omega Institute were start, 
not using the pond for recreation anymore. And so we went from a waste treatment plant to a building to the bio shelter for the 21st century and we got involved with the Living Building Challenge. And as you can see here, the Living Building Challenge uh, really embraced a lot of the design principles that we really wanted to integrate into this project. We had no idea how, how people like to say challenging that would be. Um, but again, uh, the affirmation was really reached when we had a group of First Nation grandmothers touring the plant, and one of them said to Skip when he was touring them through the eco machine at uh, the OCOSL, which is the Omega Center for Sustainable Learning. She said, this is not a waste treatment plant, this is a healing place. And these were times of affirmation after some of the challenges of the Living Building Challenge. Um, this wastewater treatment plant is like no other. People hang out here and in the classroom next door, they actually choose to do yoga there instead of the yoga studio. <laughs> it's a really pleasant place to be. And going back into plants, <coughs> the air in this building is really good. Um, as a tangential, and a couple people have hit on this, but they just did a study and it's removing 15 of the top, uh, 13 of the top 15 pharmaceutical and personal care products that we're finding in our groundwater. And we're seeing greater and greater bad consequence of that, uh, the bad consequence <coughs> of that uh, in our watershed, such as uh, amphibian turning, becoming hermaphrodite and unable to reproduce. Um, so that was just more encouraging word that biodiversity and ecological design gets more done than sometimes its primary intended purpose. Uh, what else did we put in there? So, oh, and we intend on using this system because we're talking, we're talking, trying to talk about phosphorus today. To use this as a model about how we can use a combination of native stone and biochar to take that phosphorus out of it and have uh, caches of this phosphorus rich medium that we can then apply to the fields in a uh, slow release manner instead of using the quick release fertilizers that then causes all of these downstream problems that we've been talking about today. Well, the other thing I got to do in Haiti was I got to work with Joe Jenkins, who was doing the human manure, uh, who wrote the human manure handbook. And one of the things, I mean, the Clinton initiative with good intentions and porta potties down there, but the porta potties were getting down as they were getting sent creek just dumped into the groundwater right next to the ocean. So it really wasn't a solution at all. And so the eco sand crowd, that even had no nickname, was working, but there were really no systems as good as the human work uh, system. And so Joe was in the same compound as I was, and so where that chip pipe came out and was going into the stream, I just put a header at the end of that and spread it through a wetland. And so by the time it got to the wall, the water was actually clearer and it smelled less. We didn't have anything more quantifiable or scientific than that. But we knew the water was better after it went through the wall. And what Joe did is he started prototyping or applying these human manure systems so that within a year, all of this human waste can then be applied to the fields in Haiti. And on a personal note, I just, I can't, I've never written before, presented before. <laughs> um, on a personal note, I feel that in the restorative field, we should be open sourced and collaborative. We have a lot to get done here. It's all hands on deck. So on that note, I would like to thank all of those working in their niche to improve the world we live in. And finally, so our goals are to design and work with the people of Haiti and the world to create a renewable cycle of life as opposed to a moonscape dependent on the same system that caused this destructive sequence. These guys are waiting for us to get to work with them. So whether we intended, uh, are intending on rebuilding Haiti or New Orleans or fixing our own broken and finite communities, we must adapt the natural model, create social and economic and physical communities based on symbiotic relationships and renewal. Ecology and life sciences have begun to decode the mysteries of life itself and reveal the, the more than three billion year legacy of evolution's journey. From the story, we can decode nature's operating instructions and use this information to become stewards of the earth and sea. Already through ecological design and engineering, we have learned to create soils in hostile places, reforest denuded landscapes, and with new and emerging 
technologies clean up toxic and polluted places as well as manage our waste. New discoveries and practices for the ecological transformation of the planet are being reported almost weekly. Under the shadow of a world in disarray, these are exciting times because this news is full of hope. Thank you.